Good evening. You're watching World News Tonight on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Coming up, Germany's governing coalition has been left scrambling after a disastrous showing in the country's eastern state elections. Is this the beginning of the end for Chancellor Olaf Scholz? More on that in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at tonight's headlines. Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski has begun a strategic visit to Southeast Asia as part of a push to enhance relationships with the region's countries. Poland's Education Ministry is training intercultural assistants to help schools with an expected rise in the number of Ukrainian students. And a general strike has taken place in Israel to protest the government's failure to return hostages from Gaza. Official results confirm the Alternative for Germany party has won the state elections in Thuringia and come second in Saxony. Meanwhile, the parties comprising the governing coalition failed to draw support, with a major drop in their share of the vote. The AFD has won state elections for the first time, receiving nearly 33% of the votes in Thuringia. It also came in second in Saxony, where it has just one seat less than the centre-right CDU. AFD's anti-immigration, eurosceptic and isolationist stance has led to significant criticism from other political forces and has been a cause for concern among large parts of the German public. This is a serious, uh, uh, I think, blow to the mainstream uh, political parties uh, here in Germany. Uh, and if you look across Europe, it, it, it fits with a pattern. The parties forming the governing coalition at the federal level, namely the SPD, the FDP and the Greens, performed poorly in the elections. In Thuringia, they received a combined less than 11% of the votes, and in Saxony they received 13%. The Greens lost five out of seven seats in Saxony and all five in Thuringia. These uh, Eastern European states have never been our stronghold. Uh, we, we came from a weak position originally. Uh, in uh, in previous elections, when we stood at 20% nationally, we might be at maybe 10 or 11 in Thuringia. So that's, that's a traditional weakness. The elections were also a success for the recently created BSW or Sarah Wagenknecht Alliance. The party received 12% of the vote in Saxony and 16% in Thuringia. Its platform is a mix of economically left-wing positions and socially right-wing ideas, including opposition to immigration. The party also opposes aid to Ukraine. In Thuringia, no majority government can be formed without either the BSW or the AFD. Sarah Wagenknecht could become a bit of a kingmaker in these two states uh, because uh, the, the mainstream parties will be looking to form a coalition without the AFD and they may not be able to do that without Zara Wagenknecht. Um, so there will be a debate over Ukraine policy as these, these state governments come together. All major German parties have already ruled out forming a coalition government with the AFD. The BSW is not seen as a desirable coalition partner either. This party is not at all progressive or left. Uh, it is a reactionary party. If you can't pronounce the name Wagenknecht, just say Putinknecht, then everybody understands what it's about. The electoral success of the AFD and BSW highlight the growing dissatisfaction among voters of the established German political parties. They also show that 35 years after the reunification, major differences remain between the eastern and western parts of the country. An action-packed trip to Southeast Asia for Poland's foreign minister. Radosław Szukowski has touched down in Singapore as he aims to strengthen ties and security and boost economic cooperation. He will also visit Malaysia and the Philippines over the coming days. Here's our correspondent Don Arleth with more on the story. Today, Minister Sikorsky met with the uh, foreign minister here in Singapore, as well as the senior minister for national security and the prime minister. Now, Poland has come out and congratulated Singapore on its uh, tough stance on Russia as far as sanctions go. 
Um, but still saying more can be done, of course, Russia skirting sanctions, that's something that Poland really wants to shore up on this tour here in Southeast Asia. I uh, spoke to the foreign minister and here's what he had to say. Well, first of all, Singapore is a very influential country in this region. It's important to maintain dialogue with it. Uh, I meet, I've met the um, foreign minister, the senior minister, now the prime minister. Um, Singapore is an investor in Poland and uh, a market for Polish products, including agricultural products. Um, but it's also important to tell the so-called global south about the uh, security challenges uh, in Poland, in Ukraine, in our part of the world. Now here in Singapore, uh, looking at the Polish community, we're told that it's about 2,000 people strong. Uh, we met with some of those uh, members of the Polish community here today. And of course, uh, well, they had this message uh, that they, what they wanted Minister Sikorsky to accomplish for them here in Singapore. Take a listen. I, th I think from our perspective, one of the biggest issues is visibility. Uh, we would like our country to be more visible in, in Singapore as well as the rest of Southeast Asia. Uh, people tend to know when you ask them, when you tell them you're from Poland, uh, Singaporean, never Singaporean will have heard of the country. They will have known where it is. But that's pretty much where the knowledge stops. So maybe working on PR, <laughs> uh, boosting the visibility of our country a bit more in this part of the world would help a lot. Tomorrow, Minister Sikorsky will embark for Kuala Lumpur, where uh, he will speak with the Malaysian side about uh, his concerns uh, on the war in Ukraine, as well as they will discuss the fact that Malaysia will take over the ASEAN chairmanship next year and Poland will take the EU presidency at the first half of 2025. Uh, so hopefully some uh, fruitful uh, things come out of these meetings and of course uh, in terms of uh, economic relationships and overall general uh, cooperation as ASEAN is the second most important economic organization in the world. Don Arleth reporting from Singapore, TVP World. Polish Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski also says that Ukraine's neighbours have a duty to shoot down Russian missiles that stray into their territory to assist with the protection of Ukraine. Joining us now live from Kyiv with the latest is our Ukraine correspondent Oz Katerji. Good evening Oz, this will surely be welcome news to hear in Kyiv. What has the response been? Well this is something that Kyiv has been uh, quite strong on pushing for uh, for quite some time, what, although it, it must be said that President Zelensky wants NATO allies to go much further and to shoot uh, missiles down uh, that are in Ukrainian territory. This is specifically uh, Poland's top diplomat uh, speaking to the Financial Times in an interview uh, saying that countries have an obligation, a duty uh, to shoot down missiles that stray into their territory. Now, this has been affecting Poland quite recently because uh, in many of the attacks that Russia has launched, there have been incidents where drones and missiles do arc into Polish territory before bending back into Ukraine. And this is something that, that the Ukrainian government is going to welcome uh, if it does, uh, if, if the countries follow through and, and uh, pursue it. It must be said there is much more reluctance on this issue uh, from the other countries in the EU. Uh, Olaf Scholz uh, did not like the idea uh, earlier on in the year when Zelensky had mooted it. Uh, so, again, uh, also a NATO spokesperson speaking today uh, saying NATO has a responsibility to prevent further escalation of the war uh, unleashed by Russia. So, again, not, not exactly a, a ringing endorsement there uh, for uh, Sikorsky's position, uh, although the Ukrainians are going to be ho hoping uh, that Poland does follow through. Uh, it should be said that this is a, a relatively popular measure in Poland too. A recent uh, poll taken by SW Research said 58.5% of the Polish public uh, support a measure uh, shooting down Russian missiles that stray into Polish territory. Uh, so again, this is something that will help Ukraine, uh, not just uh, by shooting down the missiles, but by uh, preventing Ukraine from having to shoot down using its own very valuable uh, anti-air defense uh, ammunition. So it's something Ukraine will be hoping that, that Warsaw's serious on, takes seriously and puts into action uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Oz. That's Oz Kataji, our Ukraine correspondent from Kyiv. 
And staying in Ukraine, a wave of Russian missiles struck Kyiv today, damaging several buildings, including educational facilities. Similar strikes have also hit other Ukrainian cities across the country. The Russians have once again struck non-military targets with their missiles. Schools were damaged in today's strikes on Kyiv, and while the material damage was quite severe, only three people were injured. We heard explosions, 10 approximately. We rushed outside. Then we heard something flying over and then the moment of the strike. I think it was done on purpose. It's a university facility and everyone knows that students are arriving for classes. Doing things like this is illegal. They hit Okhmakhit Children's Hospital and said that military personnel were stationed there. Are there military base there? Is this a military facility here? It is very annoying. It's simply horrible. My hands are still shaking. Russian strikes remain an everyday danger for major Ukrainian cities. Today's strikes in Kharkiv have injured 13 people. The day prior, a similar attack left 40 people injured. Hours later, Ukrainian forces had shelled Belgorod. Response attacks against the Russian city have become much more frequent recently. I am standing here next to burnt cars. One of them is mine. I am from the Shebekino district. Last year, my house got burnt on my birthday. Now my car got burnt. We managed to get out seconds before the shell landed. There is still shattered glass on my bed. I'm in a bit of a shock, but everything will be fine and normal. The Ukrainian government hopes that long-range strikes against Russian air bases could reduce the intensity of attacks on its own cities. For this, Kyiv needs official permission to use these weapons on Russian territory, as well as more missiles. If one of the countries allowed long-range strikes into Russia, and we have received such messages through diplomatic channels and the media, then we need to understand whether that country has supplied us with such weapons. We do not only need authorization, we also need to receive these weapons. We haven't received everything which we'd like to use. More severe waves of strikes on Ukrainian cities will most likely continue for the foreseeable future. However, a way of significantly reducing their intensity appears to be on the table. More than 80,000 Ukrainian children are set to begin studying in Polish schools on Wednesday. Let's take a look at the efforts to integrate Polish and Ukrainian children this school year. An estimated 300,000 Ukrainian children live in Poland and more than half have not been enrolled in Polish schools until now. The decision to make education at a Polish school mandatory is of course right, but long overdue. This move should have been made two years ago, so that Ukrainian children and young people would not feel excluded. We don't really know what happened to them during that time. While many Ukrainian kids have been able to learn Polish and integrate with their classmates, many struggle to fit in and choose to enroll in an online school in Ukraine instead. Children constantly laughed at my daughter's incorrect pronunciation. If it happens once, it can be a joke. But if it happens daily, you become a class clown that everyone mocks. This turns into psychological trauma. I understand that education can be better in Poland, but I still want to study in Ukraine with Ukrainian children so that I don't have to constantly translate words in my head. Many grassroots initiatives have already been put in place and the Polish government has issued a set of guidelines to ensure that both Ukrainian and Polish children are supported. In order to encourage Ukrainian parents to enroll their children in Polish schools, the Polish government made it a condition of continuing to receive a child benefit of about 200 euros per month. A lot depends on the specific school, whether it hires a teacher's aid, whether it hires a school psychologist with the knowledge of Ukraine, or perhaps a teacher from Ukraine, or whether it is a person qualified to provide this type of support. Support is much needed, as many Ukrainian children require help adjusting to the school life after the severe trauma they experienced in the war zone. During the first year, certainly no one will care about grades and such. The first thing the children need is a sense of security. 
close to 2,000 children have already lost their lives in the ongoing invasion of Ukraine, and many more have been severely wounded. Tragedy in Staines, Surrey, just an hour away from central London. A Polish man and his three children have been found dead in what is believed to be their house. Joining us now is our UK correspondent, Claudia Czerwinska, who is in Staines upon Thames. Claud Claudia, what do we know about the case so far? So, uh, so far, there's relatively very little information on what actually happened on Saturday. Um, as you can see on my right hand side, there is a small memorial in front of the house where the bodies of uh, Piotr Świderski and his three sons, all under the age of four, were found. Two of them were twins. Um, so just as I said, there is very little information. We know our understanding is that the bodies of the family members were found on Saturday afternoon. Uh, the police received a phone call call from the ambulance at around 1.15 p.m. local time, uh, informing them about uh, the discovery. As you can see, um, there is the memorial, which I mentioned uh, before, and the local community is incredibly shaken because nobody expected such tragedy to take uh, place here. We also know that according to the police office um, that is looking into this investigation, um, this was most likely an isolated incident and no third parties were involved. However, um, police watchdog, which is known here as Independent Office for Police Conduct, was informed as the people in question were actually um, addressed by the police before. Uh, we know that the mother and the remaining uh, first of kin are um, actually supported by special officers. And we also heard from the leaders of the local community, such as Tim Oliver, who's the leader of Sari county uh, council. I would encourage people not to speculate on the circumstances and let Surrey police carry out their investigations. This only speaks for itself. We don't have much information. The investigation is ongoing. And according to what we recently found out, postmortems and formal ad identification will take place at a later date. So I'll be bringing you more once the situation develops. Back to you. Thanks, Claudia. That's Claudia Chavinska, our UK correspondent from Staines upon Thames. 700 victims of the Pomeranian massacre received a state funeral in Poland today. In the first weeks of World War II, Nazi Germans killed thousands of Poles in the Pomerania province. Our reporter, Kazimierz Szwyszak, was at the state funeral and has this report. The Holy Mass for the victims of the Pomerania massacre is taking place right now here in the town of Chojnice in northern Poland in the church next to me. There are more than 180 coffins with the remains of more than 700 people. These are the victims of the so-called Pomerania massacre. In 1939, in the first months of the war, Nazi Germans massacred here between 25 to 40,000 people just because they were Polish. Artists, doctors, policemen, but also um, people from all walks of life, farmers, landowners, it didn't really matter. The Germans slaughtered them in the hundreds and the thousands and then buried them in mass graves. The Institute of National Remembrance, the largest Polish historical institution, has searched for years for the remains of these victims and continues to search for them. The spokesperson of the Institute told me how big of a moment this is for them. It's a huge ceremony, huge state funeral uh, here in Chojnice. I think the biggest uh, in the history uh, of Poland after the Second World War. And it's very symbolic that uh, we organized it, this uh, state funeral just after one day after uh, the anniversary, after 85th anniversary of the beginning of the Second World War. Another important aspect of this funeral is the fact that the families of these victims can finally find a little bit of peace. They can say their final goodbyes, and this was also extremely important to the Institute of National Remembrance. We are in contact with many families of the victims uh, of the Chojnice massacre, of the Pomerania massacre from 1939. Uh, some of them, some families live here now in Chojnice. So we uh, try to identify uh, remains. Uh, it's very difficult, but very important for everybody, for the Institute of National Members, but especially uh, for families. We try to match DNA code from the remains and from families. I'm sure that in the next few years, uh, 
uh, we will discover names of the victims and we will put the names of the graves uh, we prepared and just after this uh, state ceremony uh, we put um, uh, to the thumbs. This funeral is taking place um, on the second day of September. That is the day after the 85th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War. So uh, this uh, funeral is, has even more meaning uh, today. As I said, the most important part of this is that the families of the victims can finally find uh, some peace. And uh, that is uh, the main, one of the main missions of the Institute of National Remembrance, which continues its research to find the victims of Nazi German war crimes. From Chojnice, TVP World, Kazimierz Wyszak. Israel has faced mass protests and a general strike, with half a million people taking to the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Many services in the country were unavailable due to the strike action, triggered by the recent discovery of dead hostages in Gaza. The discovery of six dead hostages in a tunnel complex in Rafah sparked overnight protests in Israel. There was discord and anger on the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem as thousands of protesters marched through them. Frustration is growing as the Israeli government is unwilling to secure a hostage deal with Hamas. We are very, very sad and very, very angry about our government, that all they does is care about their position in the government. It doesn't care about the hostages and doesn't do anything in order to release them. The deal should have been signed a long time ago, and these people for sure, like many others, could have been saved. A clash between Benjamin Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant, Israel's defense minister, over the terms of possible ceasefire also remains unresolved. Such a ceasefire would allow the remaining hostages to be released. But despite Gallant's urges to seal the deal quickly, the Israelis' PM stance on talks with Hamas remains unchanged. Today, the protesters, now half a million of them, joined a general strike that almost ground Israel to a halt. Banks have been closed. Public transport services in many regions have been cancelled or have offered limited service. My heart is broken. Those six were captured alive and they could be saved. They were murdered by Hamas after 11 months of surviving the torture of being a hostage in Gaza. The general strike officially ended later in the day after Israel's labor court ruled it had to stop. However, widespread protests of such magnitude are bound to cause ripples in Israeli society. People have started to take to the street in a way that's unprecedented. So the fact that a mainstream uh, labor union participated in a protest is calling for strikes is a big shift. Whether or not this particular round of protests will have an impact on the conflict, we don't know because we can't guess what the government is going to do in response to the protests. But it, it is a big change for Israeli society because you have a visible peace movement on the streets in Israel that is blocking traffic, uh, being being attacked by police, they're flying Israeli flags and calling for a ceasefire for Gaza. This is a very different, a different situation than we saw a year or two ago. 101 hostages are believed to still be held captive by Hamas. They were abducted in the October 7 attack last year. So far, Benjamin Netanyahu's government has refused to reach an agreement with the captors. As the fallout continues from the state election results in Germany's east, questions still remain over the future of the country's political landscape and if the far right could repeat its success on a national level. We're joined now by executive board member of the Bertelsmann Stiftung, Daniela Schwarzer. Good evening, Daniela. Thank you for joining us on TVP World. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Daniela, let's start with the fact that it's now 24 hours on from yesterday's first exit polls in Thuringia and Saxony. What's the mood like in Germany right now? Well, the mood is not very good among uh, the moderate parties. Uh, the Chancellor, who is a social democrat, Olaf Scholz, said today uh, that uh, this result of yesterday's two elections in two regions with the far right coming in first and second has bad effects on Germany. He speaks about uh, the divisions that this will put into German society. He speaks about the economic effects and about the reputation that this has for Germany. And indeed, it is a first that, for instance, in the region of Thuringia, uh, 
a third of, of voters actually decided to, to vote for a far-right party that is being classified as extremist uh, by the security services. Like you mentioned, a number of firsts. The AfD is also the first far-right party to win a state election in Germany since the Nazi era. What message do you think the East is trying to send to the rest of the country and the wider region with this vote? Well, to understand what's happening in Germany's East, one thing is to look at uh, the campaigns and then at the motivations of voters. Um, and it's also very important to look at the structural differences that still persist in Eastern Germany. Now, first, for um, the campaign and the topics that move people, uh, of course, uh, there are issues that are ab absolutely regional ones, and those are the ones that should be dealt with in a regional electoral campaign, such as socioeconomic issues, maybe some to some extent climate transition issues, some infrastructure issues. And on all those, you um, can see that there is a pretty developed dissatisfaction among voters in Germany's East with the politics coming or the policies coming out of Berlin. But interestingly, not only the far-right IFD, but also a new party, uh, the uh, far left BSW party, uh, picked up another issue, and that is Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, both parties said that Germany should stop delivering to Ukraine and should support negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. And, and that they could, uh, discarded the actual nature of the war. They did not speak about Russia's aggression. Uh, in an adequate way, uh, they did not uh, speak about the question whether it is at, it, it is at all credible to negotiate uh, with Vladimir Putin, who hasn't stuck to international law and any negotiated uh, result over the past years with his aggression in Europe's eastern neighborhood. So those issues came in, and it is interesting to see how um, how voters were actually ready to vote for this far-right party, which in many ways, challenges uh, national and uh, European governmental policy in Berlin. Apologies, we're having a few technical difficulties, but Daniela, I believe you are still with us. How much of a role does that divide between the East and the West play into these results in your mind? Well, we, we can see that structural differences uh, make it easier in Germany's East uh, for new parties to thrive. Um, generally, Eastern Germans don't have a strong and traditional uh, for generations party affiliation simply because of the fact that this was a different political system for several decades. So it's comparatively easier for new parties to actually uh, not only get uh, votes, but also to anchor themselves within society. After the end of uh, the uh, Eastern German um, regime in 1989, uh, you know, a lot of social networks, a lot of structures broke down and weren't and really are. reconstructed. And this led to a situation that the AfD actually on a local level could really ingrain itself into German society by also supporting initiatives like youth clubs or sports clubs or getting really immersed into uh, the, the civil structures within society. And that helped them campaign in different ways and really mobilize voters to an extent that uh, we have not seen in that way in Germany before. All eyes now turn to the state election in Brandenburg later this month and then that federal election next year. How much genuine concern should a country like Poland feel about what's happening in Germany? Or is this just democracy working? Well, first of all, uh, Poland is our close neighbour and that both has a regional dimension because two of the regions uh, where AfD uh, has come out strong and will probably come out strongly in, in Brandenburg, uh, border on Poland. So he, we are neighbors here. Um, secondly, given the impact that this result may have on the general mood and debate in Germany on support for Ukraine um, and standing firmly together against Wash Russia's aggression, this will also be uh, very interesting for, for Poland to observe how, how this plays out. Of course, the regions have no real say in German foreign policy or, or defense issues. 
but um, a party which gets that presence as IFD and BSW have now through the electoral results, uh, that obviously uh, influences the more general debate on the matter. However, you, you are also right that uh, democracy is indeed at play and it is now a moment to fight uh, the extremists politically. Um, and I think this was an enormous wake-up call for the moderate political parties, three of them are in federal government, and then there are the Christian Democrats, which actually scored uh, pretty well uh, yesterday as well, um, coming first in Saxony and second in Thuringia. And so I think every single moderate party uh, as of last night will look at their strategies, not only for Brandenburg, the next regional election, which you mentioned, but really for the federal elections, which are going to be held within a year's time. And it's important to, to see that, of course, there's a potential uh, for the moderate parties to regain grounds, not only by adopting different policies and listening more closely to citizens' fears and concerns, but also by thinking about how they can conduct policies differently how can they how they can live democracy differently how can they involve citizens in participatory formats for instance all this uh, to a large extent remains unexplored and i think in these times where democracy is being challenged it's very important not only to defend democracy but also to innovate and to think how new technological tools how new ways of bringing together people, both physically and digitally, can actually be used to mobilize citizens and to, to get them engaged in issues that they are interested in. Executive Board Member of the Bertelsmann Stiftung, Daniela Schwarzer, thank you again for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And that's World News tonight. For more, do stay tuned with us here on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Good night.